Good evening. It's good to see everyone out this evening. It's a blessing to be here with you. I thank the good Lord every time I get to come. Amen. Just thank the good Lord. Brother John Barnhart, would you lead us in prayer, please? Amen. If you would, stand and get your All-American Church hymn. We'll turn to page number 26. We'll sing My Redeemer. I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me. On the cruel cross he suffered from the curse. My Redeemer, with His blood He purchased me. On the cross He sealed my pardon, paid the debt and made me free. I will tell the wondrous story how my Lord in his boundless love and mercy he the ransom freely gave sing oh sing of my redeemer by his blood he purchased me on the cross he sealed my pardon paid the debt I will praise my dear Redeemer, His triumphant power I'll tell, how the victory given over sin and death and hell. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer, through His blood He purchased me. On the cross, he sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. I will sing of my Redeemer and his heavenly love to me. He from death to life hath brought me, Son of God with him to be sing oh sing of my redeemer through his blood he purchased me on the cross he bore my pardon paid the debt and made me free amen page number 93, Heavenly Sunlight, page 93. Walking in sunlight all of my journey over the mountains through the deep has said I'll never forsake thee promise divine that never can fail heavenly sunlight heavenly sunlight flooding my soul with glory Jesus. 
Jesus is mine. Shadows around me, shadows above me, never conceal my Savior and guide. He is the light, and Him is no darkness. Ever I'm walking close to His side. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. is mine in the bright sunlight ever rejoicing pressing my way to mansions above singing his praises gladly I'm walking walking in sunlight sunlight of love heavenly Bless you. Please see. It's good to be here, folks, and good to have everybody that's with us. Hey, with some folks visiting, I guess, here in the middle. We're glad to have you. Where are you folks from? Colorado. Colorado. Hey, Amen. You didn't get here overnight. It took a little while. We're glad to have you. Glad to have you. Make yourself at home with us. Um, the, uh, the day is... Uh, the 11th, Debbie McLeod will sing for us tonight. speak your name and sometimes I just want to thank you without asking you for a thing and sometimes I lift my hands to you and sometimes all I do is cry. Everything that I have, I owe to you, Lord. And Calvary's the reason why. When I think of the love that you've given and when i think of the price you paid for me then the trials on earth 
they seem like nothing when they're compared to dark cavalry that's why sometimes i just want to praise you and sometimes just to speak your name and sometimes i just want to thank you without asking you for a thing and sometimes i lift my hands to you and sometimes all i do is cry and everything that i have i owe to you lord and calvary's the reason why yes everything that i have i owe to you lord and calvary's the reason why? That was a good day. That's good. You picked a beautiful song, too. Yes, you did. Amen. Are you folks anywhere near Columbine? You know all about Columbine, I'm sure, being from Colorado. Well, Turn the Bible, turn the Word of God to 1 John chapter 2, verse number 20, 1 John 2, 20. 1 John chapter number 2, and verse number 20. The, uh, the Apostle John says, But ye have an unction from the Holy One. And you know all things. Father, bless this holy book now. In thy name I pray. Amen. An unction means an anointing. That means a opening of the Holy Spirit uh, to your senses, to your soul, and to your spirit. And so therefore the Word of God, which is an enigma to an unsaved man, is light to your path if you're born again. And the Word of God... Uh, Rightly divided uh, is a remarkable thing. Very, very remarkable. Now, how many of you folks know that Queen Elizabeth has been in the news the last few days? She did not sit at the, uh, at the re, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, a parliament. Uh, re, what? Is that what it is? The opening of parliament. She normally addresses parliament. And... Uh, uh, if you've never watched uh, the debates on uh, BBC or one of the channels that, that shows you Parliament, you'd be, it'd be a very interesting educational thing to see the Prime Minister, who's the head of the government, answer questions to the uh, representatives in the Parliament. And it's, a quite an, it's quite a remarkable thing. The Parliament is the governing body of Great Britain and uh, Northern Ireland. And Queen Elizabeth II is the longest serving British monarch that's ever lived. And of course, there's a lot of talk right now about the crown prince, his son Charles, firstborn, being, uh, being ready to take over. Well, we don't know when. We don't know if he's gonna, when he's gonna take over. But she's lived a long time and the people of Great Britain love her. Now that's fact, they love her. And personally, I have great respect for her because I've tried to keep up with a lot of things about her. 1953, she was, uh, she was uh, uh, coronated as the uh, queen, queen. And uh, from that moment on, she took the reins and authority of the state. She does, she does not govern the, the, the uh, British Isles, but she the head of the state in that sense. But when she was uh, coronated, she sat on a throne 
And the stone of scone, the stone of scone uh, was underneath her throne. How many of you know what that is? Most of you, some do, most don't. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But the flag of uh, Great Britain is called the Union Jack. It has three crosses on it. It's quite a remarkable thing. It has three crosses. It has the cross of St. Andrew, the cross of St. George, and then the cross of St. Patrick, the great missionary Christian to Ireland. St. Andrew is supposed to have gone into Great Britain and started a church. So therefore they, in, not Great Britain, into, well, it's part of Great Britain, into, into Scotland, and started a church. And by starting a church, therefore they have a direct link with the 12 apostles. This is Scotland we're talking about now. That's a big deal to say you have a direct link with the original 12. St. George is the one who fought the dragon. He's also the head of the military in the sense that his cross is this red cross like this. And if you've ever seen uh, depictions of the Crusaders, you'll see where they're wearing a red cross like this. Well, that's the cross of St. George. You understand, of course, when the Crusaders go out, the Knights Templar and so forth, they go out fighting a holy war. That's what this is about, a holy war. And then the third cross is the red cross like this, which is the cross of St. Patrick. To me, the one of, uh, of St. Uh, 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 Andrew is a white cross like this because tradition has it that Andrew was crucified on a cross like an X, like this. And the reason is because he said, I am not worthy to be crucified like my Savior was. Uh, these words are like, like what Peter said, supposedly, traditionally. And then he was crucified upside down. Now, we cannot substantiate either one of these things. There's no, there's no history to it, but there's a lot of tradition about it. And a lot of times when you look at tradition, there may be an element of truth in it. I don't know one way or another. But the reason I'm mentioning this is because the flag of, uh, of Great Britain, Northern Ireland, Scotland, all that, British Isles, is a flag that represents the Christian faith. It has to do with uh, the champions of the faith as they carry it to the ends of the earth under Queen Victoria in the late 1800s. The sun never set on the British Empire. The British Empire was to carry the word of God to the ends of the earth. And of course, in the process, you had colonization. America was the colonies, if you remember. I don't know if they're teaching our kids anything in school today. They need to know American history. They really do. That's a shame for them not to know that. But America was a colony of Great Britain. And when this country, of course, started, it was started with the same principle that we're going to spread the light into the darkness. America became known as Columbia. Columbia is depicted as, as a woman, in different ways, traveling west. Behind her is light, where she has brought the truth, the light. And you have advancement, machinery, and all of this, where her presence has made everything better. Before her is the darkness, and she drives the heathen out of the land. Of course, the heathen at that time is the American Indian. And she's driving him out of the land and she's bringing prosperity with her because she's bringing the truth with her. And Columbia, of course, represented the Americas. That's us. You have Columbia today, a lot of Columbia. You'll find the capital of South Carolina is Columbia. You'll also find the river that leads into the Pacific Ocean, Columbia. And the re there's a, a lot of it. But the point is very simple that uh, this is what's called manifest destiny. It is that the hand of God is moving with the people to produce what you've got. In the 1700s, an African-American, 1776, her name is Phyllis Wheatley, and she is a poet. I mean, she is a real poet. And I'm going to read you what she had to say about the, uh, about the founding of this country. She said, one century, one century scarce performed its destined round when Gallic powers 
Colombia's fury found. That's France, the French. And so may you, whoever dares disgrace the land of freedoms, heaven defended race. Fixed are the eyes of nations on the scales, for in their hopes, Columbia's arm prevails. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, I like beautiful things. And this is a gift. You don't write like that unless you're gifted. Gifted. It's beautiful. Do I necessarily agree with the theology of it? No, not necessarily. But I can appreciate beauty when I see it and I hear it. But the point is this, that there was an awful lot of movement in the 1700s and the 1800s about this country and about what's going on here that directly connected it with God, Amen. with God, with God, with God. And it came from a country that uh, flag is called the Union Jack that has three crosses on it. So therefore, how, mu how, much, <laughs> how much closer can you connect yourself with God than to put three crosses on your flag, right? And that's exactly what they did. So therefore, it is by divine authority, divine authority, that they subjugate, that they travel across the earth, that they bring into their power and authority conquest of nations or peoples, and they become part of the British Empire. And the British Empire, of course, you understand that when you colonize a place, you also can make money on it. And when you colonize a place, you can also, uh, as they did, they dealt in the slave trade. Great Britain was big in the slave trade. And uh, the War of 1812 had a lot to do with that, with bringing us into it. But uh, the slave trade, uh, I suppose about every country on the face of the earth has, one way or another, at one time or another, been involved in the slave trade, which is a blight on any nation, at any time, anywhere, to traffic in human lives. That's a horrible thing. So just make you understand, you condemn it and I condemn it, got no part with it, but it's part of history. In order to understand where you are, you've got to understand where you came from. That's the biggest problem with the kids in this country. They don't know where they came from. They don't know where they're going. They don't know who they are. Once you take history away from somebody, you've taken their identity away from them. Once you take their identity away from them, then you control them. And that's exactly what this is all about. They're going to control. It's about control. And when you dumb them down, and along with taking their identity away from them and dumb them down, then you make them dependent. And by doing that, they become dependent upon the state. And so forth and so on. British Israelism teaches that the ten northern tribes, 722 B.C., that were led off into Assyrian captivity, are the people of the British Isles. That they are direct descendants, genetically, racially, and linguistically, of the ten lost tribes of ancient Israel. So and here we go. It's getting deeper and thicker. The British Israelism, a lot of people today believe it. We've had people here at Temple that believe it. I never have believed it. And the, the, one of the biggest handicaps with me about believing it is the Jews are Jew. The ten northern tribes are the ten northern tribes. And they're not us. They're not Anglo-Saxons. They're, they're not the Brits and so forth. But they say they are. And uh, they've got uh, quite a bit of beautiful music Here's beauty again, written about how that Joseph had, had, had visited the Holy Land, had visited uh, Great Britain, and had built churches there, and, uh, and that they're the direct descendants of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, ten northern tribes. The stone of scone that Queen Elizabeth was uh, coronated on is also called the stone of destiny, or it's called the coronation stone, or it's called... Jacob's pillow, taken from the Old Testament, Jacob. So now, friend, we got some connection going on here, right? The United States has never claimed anything like that, except with manifest destiny in the poem that, uh, uh, that this dear soul wrote, uh, Phyllis Wheatley, about the land of freedom's heaven-defended race, fixed to the eyes of nations on the scales, for in their hopes, Columbia's arm prevailed. In plain words, they're watching us. If you remember that uh, at the Gettysburg Address, do you remember what uh, President Lincoln said? We've met on a battlefield, of this, a great battlefield, to determine whether any nation so conceived and so dedicated can what? Long endure. 
America is an experiment. It's an experiment, still is. It's an experiment, it's a melting pot. Well, so many diverse cultures, so many diverse races, so many diverse this and that and so forth and so on, will they ever be able to establish a long-lasting culture and government? Folks, we are babies when it comes to time on this earth. Babies. They just found a, uh, a, woman, a woman bought a, a, a bust from a, from a dime store, some kind of a, a secondhand store sitting on the ground. She bought it for nothing, and she took it home with her, said, that'll look good in my garden. She got that thing home, and come to find out, it's 2,000 years old. It's a bust of Nero. Ah, so. <laughs> How in the world they came in possession of that's beyond me. I believe it was Houston, Texas. 2,000-year-old bust of Nero. And you and I both know that Nero's insane. You and I, if you know anything, you know that. He was insane. But in any event, this is used to coronate Queen Elizabeth. Eschatology plays a big part in your worldview. Your worldview takes a, plays a big part in who you are and how you relate to the church and to the world. Big deal. You're meeting in here tonight because this is a local assembly, but it's not all the assembly. The church of God is the ecclesia, the assembly of God, the body of Christ in this world. It's made up of millions and millions and millions of people right now. How many million, pre preacher? God's the only one that knows that because God's the only one that knows who belong to him. Amen. He's the judge, not me. Aren't you glad you're not the judge? I know a lot of folks think they are, but I'm not. I don't, I don't want the job. <laughs> Got enough to worry, worry with if my sorry low down self. Amen. I try to judge somebody else. The judge, the judge, shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? So your eschatology, it's Greek word eschatos, it means last thing. So, you know, they use these words, eschatology, the doctrine of the understanding of last things. There's an awful lot of people right now who believe that we're approaching the last time or the end time, that we're approaching the time of Jacob's trouble, the seven-year tribulation period. They believe that. And uh, I'm not saying I don't, but I also say this. I'm a Bible believer. And if it doesn't take place in my lifetime, I'm not gonna, it's not going to stop me from believing the Bible. You understand that? I believe the Bible. I believe the Bible, folks. Amen. And that's a, that's a blessing to me. It is. I take comfort in that. I don't, I don't waste my time to try to critique the book and find the errors in it. I don't waste my time with it. I've read a bunch of stuff by those who claim to have found errors in it, and they're all wrong. I believe the Bible. I believe it's the Word of God. So you have eschatology, which has to do with your view of the world. And let me tell you why that's important. Because if your eschatology is amillennial or, or postmillennial, you believe that that you have to do with building the kingdom on this earth. You're going to be building the kingdom. Building the kingdom. You hear that all the time, don't you? We're going to build the kingdom. Well, a lot of these people I'm sure mean well. I'm sure they do. But do you realize, my friend, when the Antichrist shows up, he's going to have a kingdom, and his kingdom is going to be in this earth? You realize that? You realize, the Lord, you realize Satan said to the Lord, he said, the king showed him the kingdom of the world in a moment of time and said, this is mine. If you're premillennial, you're not building any kingdom. If you're premillennial, you're looking for the king to come back. That's important because that's your eschatology. The Catholic Church, they have what's called a basilica. A basilica comes from the Greek word basileias. Basileias means a king. So therefore, their eschatology has a basilicus with a king sitting in it because they're going to rule over this earth. See what I mean? Their rule is here. I'm not looking for here. I'm looking for him to come back here and get me. That's a big deal, though. That, 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 that's a big deal. So when you understand these things, you understand, uh, you begin to understand why we preach what we preach. Why do I preach? I preach the kingdom of God because that's the subject of the Gospel of John, the last gospel written, 90 A.D., you know, I've gone through it a thousand times with you. The kingdom of heaven had been rejected, therefore the king had been rejected. We've already come through 70 A.D. with the destruction of the temple. Now we're at 90 A.D. We're entering into the first century 
the first century and the apostolic fathers and all of that to come. And so what we have here is the preaching of the gospel of the grace of God. And that's what the apostle Paul preached. I don't preach the kingdom of heaven tonight, folks. I preach the gospel of the grace of God. And, and, and the reason I do is because that is the gospel. The apostle Paul said, my gospel, he called it. And the reason he called it that is because that's what he got when he was in Arabia. After he was saved, the first place he went was to Arabia. The Lord said, I'm getting you out of Jerusalem. I'm getting you away from every one of them. I'm going to take you out in the desert, and I'm going to tell you what the gospel is. <laughs> and so he came back, 1 Corinthians 15, said, let me tell you what the gospel is. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. Then he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Not a word about water baptism, nothing about church membership, nothing about uh, penances and the rest of it. It's simply the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Now, I understand there's a lot that goes with that, but that's the three major things right there. That's the gospel. I preach the gospel of the grace of God because the Lord Jesus said this. He said, the kingdom of God cometh not by observation. All right? In other words, you can't see it visibly. Why can't you? Because the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. You can't put your hands on it. You can't touch it. You can't measure it. You can't find it. And the Lord Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. He said, Nicodemus, if you're not born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. See how it goes? So if, you are in, if you're building the kingdom here, you're going to try to make that kingdom look like what you think God wants it to look like on this earth. You don't, do you understand what God's getting ready to do to this earth? <laughs> if you've got a bunch of stuff piled up here, you can't take it with you, so you might as well figure out it's going up in smoke. Yes, it is. The elements will melt with fervent heat. The elements, the smallest particle there is, they'll melt with fervent heat. So I preach the kingdom of God, and I preach the new birth, and I preach it because that's what I believe. I preach it to preach to people to get ready for the Lord's going to come back. And when he comes back, he's not coming back to build a kingdom. He's coming back to get us. He said, if I go up, prepare a place for you, I'll come again to receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. And good old Thomas, God bless his soul, he said, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And the Lord Jesus said, Thomas, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I either take what the Lord Jesus said or I take modern religion, one or the other. I'm going to take what Christ said, don't you? And so uh, we, have a, uh, we have quite a thing going on here. We really do. Uh, they have Britannia in Great Britain, which is a counterpart of Columbia here. And uh, it has to do, have you ever heard the Brits sing, Hail Britannia? You ought to hear it. You ought to log on to YouTube sometime and listen to them. The flags are waving. I'm not making fun of them. Not at all. I, I, I watch them. I listen to them. I don't have a bit of trouble understanding everything they say. When I was a kid, they taught me we're learning English. I, didn't have, I, have, I had no idea there was an England <laughs> until I got a little older. Understood. English. Oh, England. Oh, you mean he came from England? Didn't come from here. Right. <laughs> right. They're very proud of their heritage. Very proud of it. And I'm not here today to, to put them down for it. But the point is this again, that the doctrine, your eschatology that connects you with this earth has you building kingdoms in this world and the kingdoms you're going, kingdoms you're going to build in this world are going to get you in trouble because you're going to have to make compromises in order to do it. And you're going to have to bring into that kingdom people that don't know the Lord. So the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom and the only people who know that they're a member of the spirit of the kingdom of God are those that are born again. Amen. And if I have to tell you tonight that you're born again, you're not. Amen. That's sad, isn't it? But you're not. You're not. You may be a good person. You may, you may be well-meaning. But I appeal to you with all of my soul and all of my spirit. If you do not know for absolute certain that the Holy Spirit has moved in and changed your life, you don't know him. I'm not, I'm, I couldn't care less if you've been confirmed. I couldn't care less if you've been baptized. I couldn't care less what church you belong to, how you were raised. 
Do you or do you not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? And when the way you know it is he moves in. And you know when the Lord Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, moved in, there's a bunch of stuff moved out. They couldn't both stay together. Can two dwell together except they be agreed? They can't do it. So we preach Christ and we preach him crucified. And we know each other. And the spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're sons of God, Romans 8. In other words, he lets you know that you belong to him. That's important. It's important, folks. It's important for you to understand that you know that you know I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day until that day. I want you to turn to 1 John chapter number 3. There are three things that mark a Christian. Number one is the new birth. His life changes. Number two, he believes strongly in the deity of Christ. Strongly, folks. Strongly. He doesn't vacillate one bit. He believes in the absolute authority of the Lord Jesus Christ as God Almighty in flesh. Any deviation from that makes you a pagan, a religious pagan, but you're not a Christian because Christians are all about Christ. It's all about him. It's not about our church movement. It's not about our big leaders. It's not about our big men. No, no, it's about him. And then finally, the work of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Ghost comes into your soul, you'll know it. You'll know it. There's no way in the world that can happen. But look at 1 John chapter number 3 and verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. That's a, something to digest right there. Therefore the world knoweth us not, see this, because it knew him not. They have no concept of the new birth. None, none, none. But look at verse number two, beloved. Now are we the sons of God. That's not an attainment or something that you earn, some future gift. It's a present possession. It's not so much what you possess as it is who you are. Now look at verse two. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, who wrote that? John. Was John there when the Lord Jesus Christ arose from the dead and appeared to the disciples? Did he not witness all of it? Did he not see the nail prints in his hands? Come here, Thomas. Put forth thy hand. Touch these. Thomas says, my Lord, my God. He didn't have to. The apostles were there. He appeared in the room as if he had walked right through the wall. They beheld him. John said, we beheld his glory as the glory, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John said that. He said, we beheld his glory. So what did John behold? He beheld the manifestation of God in human flesh. Like the Old Testament, angel of the Lord is a manifestation of Jehovah. All through the Bible, he in other words, he makes himself known. That's what it means. To manifest oneself is to make himself known. But there's another element that John introduces here. Look what he says carefully in verse number two. Now the sons of God and doth not yet appear what we shall be. All right, I'd like to know that, wouldn't you? Watch this. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Amen. What's that? That's revelation. This is this thing that you cannot find. Canst thou by searching find out God? No. You cannot find God and you cannot find the Lord Jesus Christ because when he appears, we're going to be like him. So John is saying, here's what John's saying. I saw him after the resurrection. I beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten are full of grace and truth. And yet there's something about him we don't know yet. There's more going on here than simply the eye can see. Isn't that something? Revelation. Do you notice that the last book in the Bible is the book of Revelation? It comes from the Greek word apocalypsis. And apocalypsis is just opening the veil. That's what it means. A lot of people have the idea of apocalyptic, you mean. They, they think, well, that's a big battle, you know. 
Now, the battle is the battle of Armageddon. Apocalypsis or apocalyptic means to open up for you to see. So the Bible is written like this. Bereshith, in the beginning. The beginning for what? The beginning for creatures, creation. For the creator has existed forever. In the beginning, last book of the Bible, into the future. No end. The revelation. I'm going to be honest with you tonight. I've read the book of Revelation I don't know how many times. Many, many, many times. And there are still, still things in the book of Revelation that I can't get nailed down. Believe it? Well, of course I believe it. Believe every bit of it. But I'll tell you something right now. Don't ever get cocky. Uh, you know, like you mastered the book of Revelation. You're not going to master it, folks. The book of Revelation is part of the Bible. Who's going to master the Bible? You're going to master God. He's inseparable from his word. Into the beginning, we shall see him as he is. We be like him, for we shall see him as he is. He's called the second man, the last Adam. That's quite a thing. Because all the men from the first Adam to Christ were men like Adam, the first Adam. He brings in a whole new manhood, <laughs> completely new. And then from the first Adam to the last Adam, everybody died, according to Romans 5, from the curse that was passed on them from the first Adam. Every one of us. Adam brought death to mankind. But he's called the last Adam. That means that he will bring into existence, by virtue of who he is, those who will be blessed and never cursed. Isn't that wonderful? Now let me show you how eschatology, and I'll shut up with it this, morning, uh, this evening. How many of you know who Kirill is? Kirill. He is the head of the Russian Orthodox Church. He's the head of it. You'll, if you ever see a picture, you'll see he has a white, he's got a white covering, and I think he's got a cross at the top. He, he's like the Pope to the Catholics. He's it. He's the head of the Russian Orthodox Church. Did you know that he just recently put his blessing on uh, Vladimir Putin? He blessed him when he went in there and started blowing up little women, little children and women, he blessed it. Now, I don't know what the, you know, I, I don't know the pressures involved with this man, but it, he was saying, this is God ordained. This is what God wants you to do. You go in there and you kill and you take what, uh, what's rightfully yours. And he's caught a lot of flack for that and rightfully so for making a statement like that where you can just go in and kill. Now, I'll finish with this. Somebody says, well, now, preacher, don't you understand that uh, the New World Order is, uh, is basically the Americas with European powers and, that they're, and they're headed toward it? I understand all that. I understand all that. And, and say, so, well, now, preacher, don't you realize that Ukraine's going to be part of that? And, uh, well, I'll tell you what. There may be a lot of truth in all of that, but here's the question. Here's the question. Are you okay with blowing up children? Hmm? That's called pragmatism. See, that's pragmatism. I don't, I, I'd like to see where there are no wars, but there's going to be war until the prince comes, the prince of peace. No, I'm not okay with blowing up little children, blowing women apart, and all the death and destruction that comes from war. Not a bit. But I have gotten the distinct feeling from a lot of people that they're getting exactly what God wants them to get and that God is using Russia to purge the European Union, and the New World Order. Folks, the New World Order is going, to put its, it's, going to put its, it's going to put its feet down. It's going to establish itself because the Antichrist is going to reign on this earth. It's coming. We're not going to stop that. It's coming. But in the process, I am not going to sanction the killing of babies. Now, you see them in the streets, don't you? Have you ever seen such evangelistic zeal in your life? You say, the Supreme Court is going to outlaw abortion. Who told you that? <laughs> it is not going to outlaw abortion. They're going to send it back to the states where it belongs. And let the states, in other words, let democracy rule. Let the voice of the people in that state determine how, that, uh, how they're going to live, if they're going to live with abortion. You remember that thing I gave you last Sunday morning about the 3D and then the 4D? 
I didn't know about the 4D until I did a little research in this a few weeks ago. I didn't know anything about it. I knew 3D was there. This is 4D now we're talking about. Folks, you can see frowns or smiles on the face of that baby. You can see its eyes open and close. You can see it. You can see everything. And yet they're ready to kill it all the way up to the moment of birth. And now they're trying to get a law passed through for 30 days after it's born. They can butcher it. And there's another law coming out where they try to do it after a year. They're going to butcher the children. Do you want to live with a crowd like that? Said it before, and I'll say it again, and I'll shut up. If they'll kill a baby like that, they'll kill you. Amen. Father, bless your word tonight. In Jesus' holy name, amen. God bless you, folks. God bless you. I never thought I'd, thought I'd see a day like this in my life. Uh-uh. No. Makes me want to do what, uh, what, uh, what George did. He pulled that sword out, and he slayed the dragon. <laughs> Pull it out, buddy. So who are you fighting? I'm fighting for these babies that can't fight for themselves. They're little human beings. Amen. Anybody have your prayer request tonight? Sir? Well, yeah, I'm not, yeah. I don't, I'm not advocating going out and killing anybody. No, but, uh, uh, you know, in, I just don't like the killing of babies. Never have. Don't like it. Yes. Well, God uses everything for all things work together according to the will of God, okay? He allows things to happen that will fulfill his prophecy and his will, but he's not directly involved in killing any baby. He has no part in that, no part in it. Now, Russia couldn't exist if it wasn't for the will of God. Amen. All right, anybody else tonight have a prayer request? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. All right. Okay. Does anybody else have a request? Yes, ma'am. Yes, they do. They have a lot of. I've had three of those, and uh, I had that injection, but it didn't. See, we're different. We're all different. Yeah, yeah. Okay, anybody else? Yes, sir. Okay, brother. All right, anybody else? Yes. Um, I got a uh, text message from Kyle Shirey, who visits us from Georgia. He's in Atlanta, and um, his uh, mother's husband uh, passed away last year, and he was pastor of church there. And it has now been someone stepped up to the pulpit, but they're in Gnosticism, and even going as far as saying that God's given us something like white magic. 
it's amazing. It's, it's a remarkable thing that the people would sit there and listen to something like that. It's amazing what people should listen to. Yeah. Well, I agree with that. But if you're a born again believer, like I was talking about tonight, you know, we have an unction from the Holy One. Yeah. See, that's 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 a safeguard. All right. Yes, sir. prayer. All right, anybody else? Yes. Christopher Mason. Yeah. 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 Well, I hope mama and I hope uh, the baby are doing good. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. All right. Yes, sir. in New York, New York, New York City. And they're pushing, when they go to the subways, they got to be real careful because they're pushing people in front of the train yeah. before they get there. He said it's not being reported on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. He can tell his legs are swollen. He needs prayer. Okay, brother. Amen. All right. Okay. Okay, brother. Amen. All right, anybody else? Yes, sir. Amen. Okay, brother. All right, anybody else? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Anyone else? All right. Y'all have an unspoken prayer? Would you like to come down to the altar and pray tonight? Come down here and talk to the Lord. Brother Caleb, Caleb, start us out in prayer, would you please?
the situations that are represented here in these requests. Lord, that we would see a change, we would see a miraculous working of the Holy Spirit. Father, for this young lady caught up in this wicked, godless Satanism and worldly stuff. Lord, for any other younger generation that are getting enticed by these things, these progressive, wicked doctrines. Father, this uh, rebellious spirit of this age is it always is. It's getting worse and worse, though. God, that you would give us strong, faithful young men and women that would stand upon your word. And Father, for those that are sick and afflicted for the press leaks, Lord, we intervene on them. We intercede on their behalf and pray, God, that you would help uh, Sister Presley, that she would overcome this reaction quickly. And Brother Presley, that he would uh, have his ears, the situation taken care of swiftly. Father, we ask for those that are, uh, these young girls who have been suffering these illnesses, including Hannah here at our church, and these difficulties with pain, God, that you would intervene in those situations. God, give them healing that they might be able to rejoice in you. Father, I pray for the other request for the new baby that's here. We're thankful for that, for the safety of that delivery. Lord, we know that that life is so precious. It's been precious for the past nine months. God, we rejoice in that. We pray now for the mama and the baby, God, that you would help them in this uh, coming weeks. Father, I pray that you would help our young people. Lord, that you would give them a zeal for your word, for following after Christ. Lord, but that they would see it first in us that are older than them. God, as we talk about these last things. Just come back, please, Lord. We want to see your face. I want to see, I want to see my King. Father, help us to be constantly looking for that blessed hope. But Lord, forgive me where I get lazy. Reliant upon the fact that you are coming back and thinking, well, everything will be fine then, that I, I might get lazy from time to time and not with this like I should. So, uh, just have to be so relaxed about the gospel. God, give us a zeal and a fervor for it. Lord, we've got lost people in our family. Every person here knows someone who's going to hell. God, give us the Holy Ghost boldness to reach out to them to speak the truth and love and tell them about their need. God, I pray that you'd be glorified in all that's done by your church, your bride, as it goes on. Lord, help us to look forward to Sunday, not as an opportunity to hit the altar and repent for the things we've messed up for between now and then, but God, as Sunday is an opportunity for us to gather with the saints and tell about the the things that that you've done in our lives this week. God, we trust you now. We want to glorify Christ in all things, and we ask it in his name. Amen. Father, I pray, Lord, I'd fulfill my responsibility as a pastor. I'd stand true to the truth. Heavenly Father, I trust thee. I look to thee and thee alone. Heavenly Father, I pray that I will not deviate from the path of truth, that I will not lead these people astray, give them false doctrine. Father, I know, as you say plainly in your word, we must give an account. And Father, I pray that you'd help me now. Bless Temple Baptist Church. May they stand true to the word of God, to what's been preached and taught in this church for decades. Father, it never happened here, as this brother said about the other church, where they've got a Gnostic and all of this other stuff that's come in. God help that it never happened at Temple Baptist Church. Yes. In thy holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Folks, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, we meet in Sunday school 10 o'clock Sunday morning and then uh, the worship service at 11. 
Father, bless the good folk now. Keep them safe. Go with them as they leave out of this place. Bring them back again safe. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you folks.